Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Humanities Forum. My name is Ian Bernhoft, and I direct the Humanities Forum at PC here. And looking around the audience, I think we have some guests today. I can pick you out by your dapper attire, by your serious, careworn, yet very beautiful faces. Um, so welcome very much. Uh, let me tell you three things about the Humanities Forum and what you're doing here before turning the mic uh, onwards to people who are more interesting and have more to say. So first of all, the Forum is an initiative of the Humanities Program, and the Humanities Program is an interdisciplinary, or it offers students at PC an interdisciplinary approach to humanistic inquiry, which is integrated with PC's distinctively Catholic and Dominican tradition. And so that's, that's thing one. Thing two is the Humanities Forum is an is a initiative of the program, and it's an occasion for us to gather outside of class to hear from professors, scholars, writers from around the country and indeed around the world to explore different perspectives, diverse ideas, and to ask the big questions that perhaps we don't get to ask in our daily grind. Thing number three is the format of today's event. We'll begin by us closing our laptops and you know, directing our attention to our speaker and our neighbors. Uh, our guests will speak for approximately 40 minutes or so, after which there's a Q&A period. Um, and the things you need to know about a Q&A period is that per forum tradition, a student has to ask the first question. We might expand that to say that a parent or alumnus has to ask the second question, so stay on your toes. Uh, but make sure during the Q&A to wait for, you know, once you've gotten Father Isaac's attention, make sure to get the microphone so that your words can be captured for everyone. And then by about 4.45 or 4.50, we will rise as one and head down the hall to the Fiendella Great Room, where there's some tasty hors d'oeuvres which have been prepared just for you. So, all those things being said, I want to introduce Father Isaac Morales, who is a professor of theology here at Providence College and who is the director of the C.S. Lewis Fellowship Program. So. Thanks, Ian. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this week's Humanities Forum. It's my pleasure to welcome you all, especially family and alums who are here for Homecoming Weekend. It's great to have you with us. Um, as Ian said, I am the director of the C.S. Lo Lewis Fellowship, which is an initiative that was just started earlier this year, in January of this year. Um, and the goal of the C.S. Lewis Fellowship is to promote the teaching of C.S. Lewis's writings and thought, um, particularly here at Providence, but elsewhere as well. And I'm delighted to say that our first uh, C.S. Lewis mini-grant has been awarded to Jill Waugh of the nursing school. I'm very much looking forward to working with her on that. Um, in addition, we have had speakers, and it is my great pleasure to welcome our speaker today. About a year or so ago, I was just doing a random search on C.S. Lewis stuff, and this page popped up. <laughs> and I thought, this is perfect, because we have a nursing school opening up. Uh, Sarah O'Dell is an MD-PhD candidate at the University of California, Irvine, where she is the first to complete a PhD in English with a, within a dual MD-PhD program. It's not very common. As a future physician scholar and psychiatrist, she is passionate about how the activity of the imagination, as shaped by literature, faith, and the arts, helps to heal the mind. Reflecting this core interest, her dissertation research presents the first combined study of the early Gothic novel, religious studies, and the history of psychiatry. She is also an active C.S. Lewis and Inkling scholar with a particular focus on Lewis's friend, physician, and fellow Inkling, R.E. Havard, about whom she'll be speaking this afternoon. And in her spare time, MD, PhDs have spare time. <laughs> she has been working on a book titled The Medical Inkling, which explores Havard's roles as a physician, inkling, and Catholic writer, as well as reveals how his medical imagination influenced C.S. Lewis. Her research has previously appeared in Myth Lore, Seven, the Journal of the Marion E. Wade Center, and the Journal of Medical Humanities. She is a recent Harvey Fellow, as well as a recipient of the 2023 Andrew Vincent White and Florence Wales White Graduate Student Scholarship. And her talk this afternoon is titled, R. E. Habbard, What C.S. Lewis's Physician Teaches Us About the Medical Imagination. Please join me in welcoming Ms. O'Dell. Can you 
guys hear me? We're good? Well, thank you so much for being here. It is an absolute delight to be here with you guys today. Um, so imagine with me for a moment. It's a crisp Tuesday morning in Oxford, England. You pop into a pub, the eagle and child, to grab a bite to eat and maybe something to drink. As you slide into your seat, you spot a group of men off in a corner. One of them has just finished reading something to the others. And even before the pages of his manuscript touch the table, the group springs into animated discussions. By turns, they lend praise, raise debate, and fall into laughter. Through a haze of tobacco smoke, you realize that many members of the group are Oxford dons and professors. You notice C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien in particular. And wait, is that your doctor sitting among them? The Inklings were an Oxford-based writing group who met throughout the 1930s and 1940s. Their literary impact has been tremendous, in part because of the incredible success of their two most prolific members, as you all know probably, C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien. Despite the enduring popularity of their literary circle, many are unaware of the physician who is one of the Inklings' most faithful members and one of C.S. Lewis's closest friends. Robert E. Havard, often referred to as the medical inkling, was one of the group's most regular members, but has remained relatively overlooked since his death in 1985. Often, Havard is hiding in plain sight in the margins of history and his friend's writings. For example, this photo, at the Ticken at the Trout, a pub north of Oxford, is one of the most famous photos of the inklings, who unfortunately for us really didn't take any photos together. Here we have Commander James Dundas Grant, Colin Hardy, C.S. Lewis, uh, Ari Havard, and Peter Havard, Havard's son, sometimes in the 1940s. This photo is used all the time for websites, book covers, you name it, in conjunction with Lewis. But Havard's story has never really been told. So this lecture and my in-progress book on Dr. Havard focuses on the life and writings of him but considering not only his friendship with Lewis and Tolkien, but also revealing the riches of his medical imagination. In my time spent going through the archives, I realized that there's real treasure in rediscovering Howard's published and unpublished writings. Not only stories of collaboration with other inklings and insight into their famous friendships, but also timeless reflections on medicine, literature, and Catholic spirituality. In fact, Dr. Havard's vision of medicine is sorely needed today a vision of health that considers body, soul, and the messy borderlands between them. Prescriptions not just of physical medicines, but also the sacramental medicines of literature, beauty, and the arts, a practice of healing that, as in the words of Tolkien describing Havard, that thinks of people as people, not as collections of works. In making room for the soul, Havard's holistic vision of health articulates a Christian response to mental illness as well as recognizing the healing power of literature and the arts. But before we begin to explore the riches of his medical imagination, a few biographical notes. Robert Emlyn Havard was born in 1901 in South Kyme, Lincolnshire. When he began his university education at Oxford, he initially planned on following in the footsteps of his father, an Anglican rector. But something else happened. He decided not to become an Anglican priest, instead opting for medicine as the next best thing. He also converted to Catholicism. And despite meager financial resources, he completed degrees in both chemistry and medicine, becoming something akin to the duly trained physician scientist of today. This double qualification made him an excellent candidate for medical research and teaching, yet he missed working with patients. So he and his wife, Grace Mary Middleton, who he married in 1931, moved their growing family to Oxford, where he began his practice as a general practice physician. Oops. And who would be one of his first patients but C.S. Lewis? The pair met around 1934 when Havard made a house call to treat Lewis's influenza. In Havard's reminiscence, philia, Jack at ease, he recounts that the pair spent some five minutes discussing his influenza and then half an hour or more in a discussion of ethics and philosophy. I don't know about you, but that does not describe many doctor's appointments that I have had. Their common interests, philosophy, theology, and poetry 
set a foundation for a friendship that would last until Lewis's death, almost 30 years later. Lewis makes frequent references to Havard, my doctor friend, in his letters, even going so far as to describe him as almost my greatest friend. Havard was also close with Tolkien, in part due to their shared Catholic faith. Tolkien frequently attended mass with the Havard family, and the two men were neighbors in the period between 1950 and 1968, ending with Havard's retirement to the Isle of Wight. Both Lewis and Tolkien immortalized Havard in their fiction. Lewis's trio of science fiction novels features a protagonist, Ransom, who is repeatedly whisked away on dangerous interplanetary journal journeys. In Paralandra, multiple Inklings feature as characters. While Ransom is in part modeled on Tolkien, Lewis himself serves as the narrator. Havard, referred to by his nickname Humphrey, appears as the pair's physician, valued not only for his skill, but also for his discretion. Repeating reports, keeping reports of aliens and space travel secret was presumably no easy task. Similarly, Tolkien's posthumously published The Notion Club Papers concern, contains a certain Rupert Dolbear, a research chemist with polymathic interests, philosophy, psychoanalysis, and gardening. These varied preoccupations clearly mirrored Ari Havard's real-life intellectual pursuits and professional leanings. In addition to writing and publishing essays on philosophy, religion, and aesthetics, Havard provided the first lecture of the Oxford Socratic Club in 1942, titled, Won't Mankind Outgrow Christianity in the Face of the Advance of Science and Modern Ideologies? Havard, who, like Lewis, had converted to Christianity following a period of atheism, or rather reconverted, answered in the negative. Havard's religious convictions and professional affiliations also converged in his service to Catholic monasteries and convents, where he offered holistic medical care, attentive to patients' spiritual concerns. In this capacity, he often provided psychiatric advice. This medical work culminated in a papal knighthood received when he retired. He is the only inkling to have received a knighthood, either lay or ecclesiastical. Havard also shared Tolkien's botanical interests. While Tolkien's tendency to stop and examine every tree, every flower, every bird, every in insect proved an unbearable frustration for the fast-walking C.S. Lewis, Havard often kept pace with Tolkien, eagerly examining the foliage as they went along. Their common interest in herbalism was reflected in a tongue-in-cheek Claire Hugh Tolkien dedicated to Havard. When Dr. U.Q. Humphrey made poultices of comfrey, if you didn't pay his bills, he gave you doses of squills. And as you can gather from that, squills are not exactly pleasant medicine. And while Havard's tendency to collect comfrey or squills is sadly unconfirmed, he collected and dried flowers on a number of occasions, including his travels to modern-day Ghana as a naval sur surgeon during World War II. As you may have noticed, Havard also had a particular knack for accumulating nicknames among the Inklings. He was commonly referred to as Humphrey, following an occasion where Hugo Dyson was unable to remember his name. Another nickname, the Red Admiral, was bestowed by Lewis in 1943, Havard recalls. In the war, I went to the Navy and took the opportunity to grow a beard. And when I returned with this reddish beard, Jack promptly nicknamed me the Red Admiral. This, I will say, was far from my real rank, which was Lieutenant. Havard's final nickname was the Useless Quack, or UQ for short. Described by Havard as less complimentary, the nickname itself originated with Lewis's brother Warren, or Warney, who along with Lewis and Tolkien often depended on Havard for transportation. He was the friend with the car. Havard notes, I'd let down some promise to give them a lift, and he referred to, where's that useless quack Humphrey? Unfortunately, this last moniker, clearly not crafted in reference to his abilities as a physician, has been wrongly interpreted by a few scholars. But I digress. In all in all, Havard's respective friendships with Lewis and Tolkien outlasted regular meetings of the Inklings and survived long after the relationship between the other two men had cooled. Havard comments that it was the differences between himself and Lewis that laid the foundation of a friendship that lasted with some ups and downs until his death nearly 30 years later. He also insightfully comments on the differences between Lewis and Tolkien, contrasting Lewis, a big, full-blown man who came straight out at you, with Tolkien, a slight figure whose whole manner was elusive rather than direct. He continues, the word flighty crosses my mind in connection with Tolkien. 
It's misleading because I don't mean it in the ordinary sense of the word at all. But he would hop from subject to subject in an elusive sort of way. You could see his mind was always hovering like a bee over flowers, whereas Lewis was working away more like a carpenter at a carpenter's bench. These are very imperfect descriptions of their differences, but they were very apparent at close contact. They were two very different people. And the surprising thing is, really, that they became such close friends, rather than that the differences appeared and separated them. This vision of Tolkien as a bee flitting among flowers and Lewis hammering away like a carpenter gives a taste of the medical inkling's flair for imaginative language and his sense of individual psychology. So how did all this translate into Havard's clinical practice? Dr. Havard's medical imagination, both what he imagined to be good medicine and what he considered the role of the imagination in healing, bears special relevance for his work as a Catholic physician deeply invested in literature and the arts. Dr. Havard's son, Colin Havard, has noted his, fa has noted his father's sensitivity in treating not just the body, but also the mind or the soul, commenting that he had a good sense of psychology as well as pure physical medicine. To my knowledge, there are no existing records of Havard's clinical practice. And of course, even if there were, patient privacy wouldn't allow us just to read them all. Nonetheless, we can catch a glimpse into Havard's vision of medicine, as well as the ways in which he blended medicine, aesthetics, and religious conviction in his writings relevant to mental illness. The medical inkling left behind a wide diversity of published and unpublished writings, scientific research, poetry, essays, book reviews, and memoirs among them. So today, I'd like to follow a particular thread through these writings, tracing Havard's enduring interest in what he described as the ill-defined borderland between body and mind. Havard's understanding of human nature was, of course, essentially Thomistic. We are not merely body or merely soul, but the two operating together as one. In technical terms, this being hylomorphic dualism. In a 1956 book review, he comments on the relationship between body and soul, noting that if body and soul are one thing, then any activity of the soul, as in prayer, will be reflected in some way in the body and vice versa. If this is true, and true everywhere, not just in the sanctuary of a church service or in the theology classroom, then this necessarily informs the way in which we think about medicine. If medicine affects both body and soul, and never just the body, then each act of healing is charged with spiritual potential. Ideally, healing encounters would then be oriented towards the whole person, treating the body through the mind and the mind through the body. In many ways, my book project is centered around this healing imagination, both what we imagine as appropriate to medicine and how the imagination itself participates in healing. However, since the book is yet to be published, we'll content ourselves with a few literary case studies from the hand of the medical inkling. And just as a note, uh, most of these examples represent a portion of a book chapter, particularly a chapter on Havard's practice of psychological medicine and a chapter dedicated to his writings on literature, beauty, and liturgy. So our first case study is Havard's contribution to Lewis's first work of apologetics, The Problem of Pain. So as Lewis wrote The Problem of Pain, he read chapters of the in-progress work to the Inklings. In his biography of Lewis, George Sayers highlights the contribution of two particular members of the circle, Havard and Tolkien, who had provided many suggestions. The Problem of Pain is notable not only as Lewis's first meaningful work of apologetics, but also as a collaboration between members of the group. Inkling scholar Diana Glyer goes so far as to identify the book as a joint project among the Inklings. In addition to seeking his feedback, Lewis asked Havard to write a clinical supplement to the book. His short note on the observed effects of pain kindly supplied by R. Havard, MD from Clinical Experience, forms the appendix to the book. What's really interesting about the appendix, however, is what wasn't published. An earlier draft of the appendix titled Pain and Behavior in Medical Practice provides fresh insight into the collaboration between Havard the physician and Lewis the up-and-coming apologist. Havard's original version not only proves a turning point, considering his role within the Inklings, but also prevents a, presents a fresh lens through which to consider Lewis's The Problem of Pain. In his memoir, uh, Havard recounts the events surrounding the appendix, noting that he was glad to fulfill Lewis's request and that he took some trouble over it. On February 1st, 1940, a version of the appendix was read out loud at the Inklings, uh, at, at Ann Inklings in Lewis's rooms in Maudlin College, likely by Havard himself. 
he also explicitly comments on the writing process. Lewis had suggested around 1,000 words. When he saw it, he seemed pleased. He edited it, shortened it, for I'd overrun my allowance. I was impressed by the trouble he took to get it right. Despite this apparent insistence that Lewis got it right, the reality is not so simple. Havard's earlier pub and published draft tells a more complicated story, providing insight into their collaboration and revealing Havard's sympathetic and nuanced approach towards mental suffering. First is the question of length. Havard's draft overshot Lewis's suggestion of about 1,000 words by a margin of 100. He's almost in that word count. You guys know, you guys have written papers, you know, when you're almost at that word count. Yet the published appendix totals a scant 539 words. Some of Lewis's changes constitute what one would expect of an attempt to shorten the piece. Repetitive elements are removed, sentences are tightened, and several paragraphs are reorganized. But despite these stylistic edits, nothing new is added beyond the occasional punctuation mark or preposition. More important remains the question of content. What exactly was removed? And having the length of the draft, Lewis did not enhance, but unfortunately greatly diminished the essay. The manuscript itself does not suggest another editor, and all present revisions are in Havard's hand. In the absence of other data, trusting Havard's account of who edited the appendix remains the most reasonable interpretation. Comparing the two versions reveals a series of surprising alterations. Lewis removed not only Havard's imaginative passages, but also his emotional sensitivity, transforming his compassionate account of mental illness into a relatively glib account of insanity. Havard's unpublished draft reveals the extent of this revised clinical imagination, restoring Havard's emphasis on the tragedy of severe mental illness, the humility of the practitioner, and the value of providing care. One paragraph in particular demonstrates the near elimination of Havard's focus on the experiences of mental illness. The published paragraph on, quote, actual insanity is only a few sentences in length. And this was what was published. In actual insanity, the picture is darker. In the whole realm of medicine, there is nothing so terrible to contemplate as a man with chronic melancholia. But most of the insane are not unhappy or indeed conscious of their condition. In either case, if they recover, they are surprisingly little changed. Often they remember nothing of their illness. This section bears the brunt of Lewis's edits, representing four scattered sentences pieced together in such a way that obscures their original meaning. Madness here lacks meaning, a mental blank to recover from without memory or scar. The physician speaker remains detached from his subject, viewing an imagined patient from a far distance, terrible to contemplate yet of minimal significance to the sufferer. In contrast, the original paragraph highlights the tragedy of madness from a position of humility and compassion. Habert's description does not gloss over the, the sufferings of severe mental unrest. He describes the gradual obscuring of character that occurs in such cases and recognizes the severity of severe mental breakdown. The phrase possessed of a devil is graphically descriptive. This is no mere unconsciousness. Crucially also, Habert admits the limits of contemporary medicine. Our ignorance of the cause or cure of most examples of insanity is still complete. We are spectators, helpless to cure, alleviate, or even understand the suffering of the victim. The physician is not reduced to a spectator by their own volition, but is made to bear witness in the form of a powerless audience. He continues this turn of dramatic language when considering the man of chronic melancholia, what we would today, again, this was, you know, 1940s, likely recognize as severe clinical depression. In a portion completely eliminated by Lewis, Havard remarks that to speak with him has all the effect of witnessing high tragedy transferred from the stage to life. And concluding the paragraph, Havard leaves the possibility of meaning for such suffering, as well as notes that caring for the sick provides an opportunity for both spiritual formation and personal reflection. It is impossible to form a conception of what insanity means to the sufferers themselves, but to look after the insane is a valuable discipline. It teaches gentleness and self-control. It induces a deep humility when it is recognized that reason itself is a gift which can be lost. All flippancy is gone. Madness is no mere unconsciousness. Severe mental illness becomes a force capable of obscuring personality to the point that a patient appears possessed by malevolent supernatural powers. 
Havard admits the woeful gaps in contemporary medical knowledge while directing the reader's attention to the lived experience of madness, however inscrutable. The physician is painfully aware of their spectator position, yet the report is not purposely detached, clinical, and sterile. In a time long before the development of antipsychotic medications or SSRIs, the physician bears witness in relative powerlessness. Yet the private experience of mental illness is not relegated to obscurity and amnesia. Havard approaches the question cautiously, naming his own imaginative limits and speculating to the inner experience of madness. He does not deny that insanity bears meaning for its sufferers. Complementing this humility is the, question, the suggestion that caring for the sick, especially the mentally ill, provides an opportunity for spiritual formation. Such service not only deepens virtue, but also prompts the recognition that human reason is not absolute in any of us. Havard complicates Lewis's valorization of reason in the problem of pain, recognizing that our physical vulnerabilities extend to the mind-brain relationship. Overall, pain and behavior treats mental illness with grace, with humility, and with an understanding of loss. Havard makes room for the possibility of meaning, even within chaos. So with all that, we have to ask ourselves, why did Lewis make these edits? And when he did, what did Havard think? In Havard's memoir of Lewis, he clearly links this account of their collaboration with the discussion of Lewis's writing advice, noting that around the time of their collaboration, there was some discussion on the ethics of writing. Havard recalls that Lewis maintained that the first duty of an author is to entertain, and advise writers to avoid ornament and purple passages. As Havard continues, Lewis's revisions seemed to hover beneath the surface. All the Inklings had learned by experience that passages valued most by the writer appealed least to the reader. It is a hard saying, but worth remembering. However, Lewis removed more than mere ornament. While it was not Lewis's aim to discuss mental illness at length, Per his preface, the only purpose of the book is to solve the intellectual problem raised by suffering. His deletions represent a missed opportunity to incorporate a symmetry of tone and purpose. The more personal tone of Lewis's preface in The Problem of Pain gives a glimpse of this lost balance. And this is Lewis. For the far higher task of teaching fortitude and patience, I was never fool enough to suppose myself qualified. Nor have I anything to offer my readers except my conviction that when pain is to be born, a little courage helps more than much knowledge, a little human sympathy more than much courage, and the least tincture of the love of God more than all. These words are far more personal. Here Lewis acknowledges the reality of pain that has closed the intellectual distance mediated by theodicy and knocks on our very door. Both the preface and Havard's original appendix hint at the reality of when pain is to be born, the actualities of our suffering, and the potential for sympathy, grace, and transformation that reside even within these most painful moments. The more intimate tone of the preface remains distinct from that of the published appendix, where words of personal experience and virtue have been cut away. It seems likely that Lewis's resistance to discuss mental illness stemmed from a fear of madness, an anxiety prompted by caring for Mrs. Moore's brother, Dr. John Askins, for a fortnight in 1923 when Lewis was a young man. Affectionately referred to as the doc, Askins had dedicated much of his post-war work to psychoanalysis, which in the heyday of Freudianism, Lewis very much held in suspicion. Uh, doc Askins had also flirted with the occult, prompting the young Lewis to attribute his mental collapse to spiritualism, yoga, which is obviously yoga is very different today, it seems, an undigested psychoanalysis, the harrowing experience on the front line of insanity, talking a man down from nervous fits and physically restraining him when episodes became violent, left a mark of Greek and terror on Lewis's imagination. Lewis was disturbed by a sort of horrible sympathy, a cursed feeling that I could quite easily do it myself, and the experience almost changed his deep-rooted conviction that no mental pain can equal bad physical pain. In this light, Lewis's revisions likely stem not from an intellectual lapse, but from a deeply personal history. The remnants of a youthful conflation of the occult and madness, an attempt to avoid the emotional weight of a memory, the need to focus on the intellectual task at hand, the carpenter at the carpenter's bench. Ironically, the most often quoted portion of the appendix and the problem of pain by large is just as often misattributed to Lewis. Mental pain is less dramatic than physical pain. 
but it is more common and also more hard to bear. The frequent attempt to conceal mental pain increases the burden. It is easier to say, my tooth is aching, than to say, my heart is broken. Perhaps the physician could speak to what the Don could not or would not say. In a 1956 letter to Arthur Greaves, Lewis comments that, my doctor friend says that surprised by joy leaves out too much, and he is going to supplement it by a book called Suppressed by Jack. Despite the suppression, as it were, of the psychiatric and the problem of pain, Havard's original draft reveals the virtues of his approach, as well as the value of his clinical experience, intellectual humility, an attentiveness to story, and the recognition that when it comes to the meaning of suffering, the patient, not biomedicine, gets the last word. Our second case study takes us to a series of essays Havard wrote for a Catholic journal, The Franciscan Annals. Titled The Uses of Diversity, Havard focuses on the diversity of ex opportunity to experience beauty. He asks, what is the role of beauty in our lives? Broadly, his answer takes the form of three movements, diagnosis, prescription, and guide. So diagnosis. Havard begins with a crucial diagnosis, again, probably not one that you or I have heard in a doctor's office. We are starved for beauty and made sick by this lack in our aesthetic diets. Even more so, this malnourishment brings an accompanying loss of insight. We've become so used to the deadening effects of our environments that we forget that things could be otherwise. We have lost the capacity to imagine alternatives. Havard's first goal, then, is to arouse in his readers a strong feeling of discontent, a dissatisfaction of a rather special kind. In questioning the position beauty has in our work, our surroundings, and our minds, Havard underscores the deleterious effects of beauty deprivation. If deprived of it for too long, he writes, we are starved and miserable and lead narrow, imperfect, and undeveloped lives. Because God is the source of all beauty, ugliness is a kind of evil, a poison which makes us ill at ease, strained, and restless. For Havard, ugly environments are, in a really true sense, pathological ones. Without beauty, our senses are deadened in a vicious cycle of jaded nerves and enfeebled hearts and minds. Our environments do not only represent our emotions, but they produce them. Ugly environments induce a certain unease, a certain ill health. We are constantly caught in a dynamic with our surroundings. Man-made architectures correspondingly make certain kinds of men and women. And what of the environment of Havard's readers? What of our environments, for that matter? In surveying the landscape of a modern, industrialized England, he rails against its appalling ugliness. Miles after mile of fresh earth in the environs of our great cities, ruined by slag heaps, oily pools, squalid, mean little houses. Places where industry have de has developed on a large scale are especially scarred by extended blot and pollution. It is an ugly age, he writes, perhaps the product of an ugly spirit, that of the industrial greed of the last century. We have inherited an evil thing and have not yet found the courage or the wisdom to attempt to, to transform it into something better. Now that our hearts have been appropriately discontented and our illness has been made apparent, Havard's diagnosis is complete. He ends his first installment with a question. But what is the Christian remedy for this state of affairs? So part two, the prescription. Havard begins by quoting Matthew 4.4, 4, notably from Ronald Knox's translation of the Vulgate. Man cannot live by bread only. There is life for him in all the words which proceed from the mouth of God. If beauty is one such word, and if we are intended to be surrounded by beauty, that is, if we are meant for the enjoyment of God, the source of all beauty, we must feed ourselves upon beauty as we are designed to do so. Where is such beauty to be found? Parallel to his critique of industrial Britain, Havard considers two main sources of beauty, the natural world and objects crafted by human hands. He begins with our physical environments, reflecting on their ability to shape our emotional and spiritual lives. Despite the losses, both natural and architectural, suffered in the wake of industrialization, beautiful environments remain. He praises the unspoiled countryside, its noble rivers, rolling hills, and rich quiet meadows proving a verdant source of natural beauty. Sounds a bit like the Shire, no? Havard's praise of the singular beauties of the English landscape brings to mind his own experiences hiking in the Lake District, 
or his walks with Lewis and Tolkien. Havard argues for the refreshing effects of natural environments, asserting that our spirits are more easily kept clear and free under their influence. Although he admits that God seems closer in rural landscapes and cites even Christ's tendency to withdraw into the hills, he does not condone complete withdrawal from man-made cities or towns. Dosage, as it were, remains important, tempered with the beauty also present in man-made environments. So just as Havard mourned contemporary architecture in his first installment, he praises ancient medieval architecture as some of man's more, most beautiful and noble achievements. As with natural beauty, England, of course, he's writing in Oxford, is particularly favored in her architectural treasures, a plug for any of you considering going to Oxford. For Havard, the beauty of architecture has several layers. First, buildings can simply be beautiful. This building is simply beautiful. And a quiet Sunday walk, morning walk through an older town or city reveals marvels of beauty enshrined in stone. These edifices are not limited to the physical beauty of stone. They also assume a sacramental participatory quality. In beholding the wonders of Salisbury Cathedral or Maudlin Tower, Havard draws our attention to the careful thoughts, plans, and labor that generated such places. We are looking at men's thoughts, he muses, and we can see and sympathize with some part of the beauty that they saw and loved. In living in Oxford and visiting Lewis's rooms at Maudlin, for instance, Havard often looked at the college's famous tower completed in 1509. But Havard also attempted to look through the edifice to catch a glimpse through the eyes of the late medieval craftsmen to sympathize with the beauty that they sought to incarnate. His way of looking is reminiscent of Lewis's meditation in a tool shed, in which Lewis describes both looking at a beam of light from the outside and stepping into the light so that the light illuminates his vision of the outside world. Lewis argues for the value of living inside phenomena, that complete meaning comes from within experience, not without. Havard applies Lewis's dictum to always look both along and at everything to architectural environments, allowing them to serve both as a beautiful object and an immersive experiential portal. Such imaginative transport becomes a type of time travel, erasing our prejudices regarding the past, what Lewis would term chronological snobbery. In architecture, Havard writes, we can for a moment leap out of this industrial century into a time when men, just ordinary sinful men, loved beauty and toiled to attain it. By training our attention to the art of the past, we gain a sense of communion that transcends our historical moment. This turn towards the beauty in men's minds carries Havard to other created, or perhaps as Tolkien would say, sub-created works, literature, poetry, art, music. The magic of poetry enables this transport, communicating the thoughts and emotional states of the distant past. Havard's musing on the effects of poetry are well worth quoting in full, especially as he moved towards a theory of poetry more generally. He writes, by so clothing a situation with beauty, the poet makes it a living thing for us. Not only do the poets see further than most of us, but they have the art of making us see with them. And we see moreover in an especially vivid way. For they bring not merely intellectual knowledge, they stir feelings and emotions, they educate our hearts. So that there is in the world of poetry an enormous wealth of beauty waiting only for our leisure, attention, and exploration. And if poetry is a world, literature as a whole is an entire universe. Some of the greatest achievements of the human race are preserved in literature. We can resurrect and enjoy them when and as often as we please. We can meet with and converse with the greatest human minds, not only of our own days, but of all ages. We can escape from the narrow confines of not only our own town and city, but of our own time as well. We are free to range over all historic time, and the whole world. Literature will take us into the homes and lives of the wealthy and the poor, to the minds stored with learning and to minds rich only in the experience of suffering. The whole pattern of humanity is there for our study and delight. Here, Havard provides a rationale for the therapeutic value of literature. We see not only with Havard, but with the poets. They expand our senses, bringing an education that is effective, pre-rational, and colored in the tones of moral development. Literature, an entire universe, places us in community with minds of those from different backgrounds, 
other cultures, and other times. Reading generates community where it may not or could not exist. Not only this, but reading also transcends place, a, me a means of healing our limited purview and gaining invaluable insight into the whole pattern of humanity. Havard characterizes literature as a portal that not only exposes us to much needy, needed beauty, but also invites us to new to us worlds. Under Havard's pen, music and the visual arts are also recognized as such portals. Careful attention to music and art brings incalculable rewards, nourishment, strength, and healing. Music in particular will carry you into a way of pure beauty beyond language. Literature, poetry, architecture, music, and the visual arts are all capable of altering our perception inducing participation, community, and an expansion of the spirit. In describing the participatory, or even you could say sacramental, quality of literature, Howard anticipates many years before Lewis's an experiment in criticism, which wasn't published till 1961. So published nearly 15 years after the uses of diversity, Lewis's experiment argues that works ought to be judged by their readers. He poses that books capable of not simply being used for our own ends, but being received, surrendered to, and which provide, uh, permit, invite, or even compel good reading cannot be discounted as bad literature. So basically, you judge a book not by its cover, but by its readers. Have you ever met someone and they give you a really good book recommendation? You're like, well, I trust you, so it must be a good book. So that's the idea. Uh, Lewis recenters the relationship between reader and text as crucial for both the literary critic and the ordinary reader. Both must, must surrender, and this is Walter Hooper, both must receive, both must welcome good literature's embrace with openness, obedience, and a whole heart. Today, an experiment in criticism is perhaps best remembered for its often quoted epilogue in which Lewis attempts to answer the question of why we read it all. He writes, we seek an enlargement of our being. We want to be more than ourselves. We want to see with other eyes, to imagine with other imaginations, to feel with other hearts as well as with our own. We demand windows. Literature is a series of windows, even of doors. Literature provides windows, provides portals, opening up new worlds, providing access to other minds, other ways of life, other historical periods. Lewis even goes so far as to make explicit the therapeutic dimensions of literary participation. Literary experience heals the wound without undermining the privilege of individuality. In reading great literature, I become a thousand men and yet remain myself. Here, as in worship, in love, in moral action, and in knowing, I transcend myself, and I'm never more of myself when I do. Through careful attention, literature allows for us to transcend ourselves in an echo of the Christian paradox of dying to self. Finding communion with the writers of the past provides a therapeutic reorientation in which we are healed, if only momentarily, of the wound of our own individuality. And this language of healing is not simply metaphor. Literature bears therapeutic potential that is real, that is practical, and that is necessary. Lewis's insistence on seeing, imagining, and feeling with others is matched by Haber's theory of literature and art, seen with the architect and the poet, hearing with the musician. Haber places his finger on the pulse of each work, of such work, all the while making explicit its otherwise implicit healing implications. So part three of Havard's, you know, three-part prescription, or diagnosis prescription, is finding a guide and growing a practice. So as often as Havard praises the therapeutic riches of literature, music, and the arts, he just as often underscores the fact that these benefits require effort, namely the cultivation of attention through study and discernment. Because this wealth does not altogether lie on the surface, Havard asserts that we need guides and we need teachers to accompany our digging for buried treasures. Without guidance, we're likely to reject what could nourish us or even be choked by the very wealth we uncover. As teachers' first task is to arouse our interest, lighting a spark of attention and then shaping that attention once it has grown. Part of this work is the struggle to disentangle ourselves from the ugliness of our surroundings generating a critical distance towards our immediate historical context. While Havard again affirms that beauty draws us towards the divine, he also emphasizes the realities of our health now. If we are to survive the poisons of our environments, we must find ways to inoculate ourselves against them. 
Dr. Havard's prescription for resistance, learned to appreciate great literature and art. This foundation, he suggests, opens up the supreme literature of the liturgy and the Bible. An education in the principles of great art draws us towards the most difficult art, the art of good living. Reflecting on Eric Gill's assertion that every man is a particular kind of artist, Havard affirms that we all are artists, capable of expressing beauty, even through the lives that we build and live. Havard speculates that this is a crucial aspect of the Christian life, stating that Christ himself would not only have us recognize the beauty inherent in nature and other people, but also have us try to learn to express beauty as a return, however dim and imperfectly of the beauty that Christ has shown us in such richness and diversity. Such, for Havard, are the uses of diversity. Even if most of us will not become professional or even accomplished artists, Havard underscores both the artistic capacity of, of all and the need to support the arts. These endeavors take on an evangelistic flair. If, if the church is the supreme example of true beauty, then the greatest need of the world today is the growth of the Catholic culture, profound, true, beautiful, and attractive. Writing as a Catholic physician, he focuses not only on the health of individuals, but also the health of their larger cultural context. Havard's conclusion to the uses of diversity is notable for a sense of opportunity and urgency. Even given his 1940s era assertion that the world is very sick, more sick than it has been for 1,500 years, his final rallying cry remains, remains relevant. He writes, in order to combat the evils and dangers of the modern world, we must switch, again, you know, the modern world, Lewis and Tolkien and the Inklings are very, you know, they like their medieval Oxford, of course. We must educate ourselves into the full riches of Catholic truth and beauty. We must seek them out, study them, until they become a part of us and we live by them. But beyond that, we must study also to express them. We must produce writers, painters, musicians. It is this task that is of compelling urgency. The reader of the uses of diversity has been made aware of their sickness and its cure. Now it remains for them to go forth and foster the healing of others through the cultivation of the arts. So in closing, I would like to leave us with an image of Dr. Havard as a mediating figure between the sciences and the humanities. Havard's position is undoubtedly unique. The only scientifically trained member of a renowned literary circle and a practicing physician embedded among some of the greatest Christian authors of the 20th century. Havard's Christian commitments, in particular his Catholic convictions, color the majority of his writings, indicative of a wide array of genres, medical commentary, theological reflections, apologetics, poetry. Havard's interdisciplinary leanings gain increased relevance in our age of ever-increasing specialization, as they suggest a model of integration between the disciplines. Even as inkling scholars praise Lewis's ability to merge imagination and reason through the Christian faith, Havard's engagement of the two cultures of the sciences and the humanities occurs under the umbrella of Christian thought. Havard not only serves as an example of the physician scientist and the Christian poet, but also embodies the ideals of the medical humanities long before the inception of the field, so named in the 1970s. Broadly, the medical humanities are concerned with the intersection between the arts, the humanities, the social sciences, and the practice of medicine. More specifically, things like narrative medicine seek in part to illuminate the ways in which the engagement of literary narratives can transform the clinical encounter. By studying literature, physicians are better primed to recognize, interpret, and respond to the stories of their patients. But in many ways, the medical humanities emerge as a symptom of a diseased healthcare system, one that has lost an attention to mind, soul, and imagination. As if answering this lack, Havard's approach to medicine is also remarkably sacramental, ministering to the soul while healing the body. A sacramental imagination is one in which, as Andrew Greeley notes, objects, events, and persons of daily life are revelations of grace. Created reality is a sacrament, that is, a revelation of the presence of God. Like sacrament, Havard's imagination-fused medicine has both inherent efficacy and is activated by our attention and belief. This kind of medicine takes place in the rituals that structure acts of healing. What is said? What does the clinic look like? What beliefs and expectations structure the therapeutic encounter? Often we think of these elements as being on the margins of medicine, focusing on the strength of a certain prescription, say an antibiotic's ability to ward off infection, or the material rearrangement of tissues that happens in a surgical setting. 
But Havard also directs us to that strange, ill-defined borderland between body and mind, the realms of the somatopsychic, where body acts on mind, and psychosomatic, where mind acts on body. These twilight realms of medicine arguably color every healing encounter. I take the antibiotics because I trust in the expertise and goodwill of the physician, and I believe that the medicine will cure, not harm. There is a sense in which medicine cannot be utterly secular in a certain sense of the word. Belief and ritual are inescapable. As a Catholic physician, the rituals of Havard's practice of medicine implicitly take this into account. Belief matters. Beauty matters. The humility of the practitioner matters. The spiritual discipline matter. The imagination matters. My In Progress book, The Medical Inkling, is dedicated not only to Dr. Havard's life, works, and place among the inklings, but also the healing work of the imagination. I look forward to sharing more as it unfolds. I would also like to extend my sincere thanks to the Havard family. You can see in these lovely pictures. Uh, particularly John and Colin Havard for their incredible support of my research and their friendship. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. We have time for questions now, and as Dr. Bernhardt said, the tradition is to begin with a student question. So is there a brave student out there who has a question? <laughs> oh, great. Hi, um, my name is Margaret. That was a wonderful talk. Oh, thanks. Um, just want to say thank you for coming. How did you come to this interest, you personally? How did you, this is, I've never heard of him before, so how did you come to this like interconnection also of like beauty and medicine? It's really cool. Yeah, it's a wonderful question. There's kind of two secret questions in it, so I'll answer them both. Um, the first being that um, I was a science major. I know a lot of you, you know, undergrads, I was a science major, and I'd go in the science laboratory, and I'd like sneak in my book of poetry and my you know, Aquinas and my theology book, and I'd, I'd have the PCR running, but I'd like be reading you know, poetry in the corner. Um, and I always kind of felt torn in two directions, and how do you kind of reconcile those things? And the way our, you know, our educational uh, system is set up now, you choose a major, you, know, you guys have a wonderful program here where you get the, you know, the solidity of a liberal arts education, uh, but I always felt kind of torn. And so then um, after my undergraduate, I did a master's in English, and then I did both. So instead of choosing, I'm doing both the um, medical degree and the PhD in English, and was given a great recommendation by a dear mentor who um, turned me on to the medical humanities. And then for Robert Havard in particular, um, was another mentor. I was doing a master's in English at Azusa Pacific with uh, Diana Glyer. She wrote the company they keep, as well as a number of other books. And she turned to me one day and she goes, well, Sarah, of course your project's going to be on Dr. Havard. And I went, OK. Um, and kind of, you know, you start getting into the archive and you get into the dusty library, and you realize that there's so much that hasn't been talked about. And the more you dig, the more you find this story. And it's, and it's been a real privilege um, working with his family in particular. You know, you never know what people have in their, their attics, and they bring out a box, and they're like, oh, these? And you're like, oh my gosh, it's the first edition of The Hobbit with a you know, letter stuck in it, um, and things like that. It's been a real blessing. Great question. Thanks. While I'm waiting for a hand, might I ask a question? Uh, I was wondering about bridging the two parts of your talk. Does um, Havard have anything to say uh, explicitly about how beauty might treat mental illness, apart from kind of the general things that you said in the second part? It's hard because we don't really have a lot of these you know, case studies. We have some other things that he, um, he wrote, uh, a chapter in a book called Religious Sisters, which was for um, kind of like the, the medical care um, in convents. And he has some more things in there. And he, um, a lot more that he belongs to kind of this lost era of physicians where you know, you're, they're writing some paper about medicine. And they're like, well, as you can see in Macbeth, you know, there's a very clear instance of this clinical pathology. And he's kind of like this vestige of this, you know, I don't know many doctors that are all of a sudden like, well, you know, we can see this. And like, you know, and I was like, oh, OK. Um, more so that for him, they were so integrated that he wasn't you know, doing like a clinical trial on like, you know, the effects of beauty, unfortunately. But yeah. Hi. 
Hi, um, I'm, I'm a nurse practitioner. I don't know how far along you are, so how much clinical um, you've done. Um, any, I agree with this, and I do try and bring in kind of the whole patient. I, I deal with a very specific, very sick population. Um, but as I'm sure you know, time is so limited. You've got you know 20 minutes <laughs> slots to deal with an advanced heart failure patient. Um, how do, you, do you, any practical ideas on how to bring kind of beauty and the the soul into the clinical experience visit? It's a wonderful question and a big one. You know that yeah the constraints you kind of get in there you have all that pressure to see a certain number of people in a certain amount of time. Um, I would say you know Rita Sharon narrative medicine just being there and bearing witness. Um, something that I'm also very interested in is like, what does the office look like? You know, we're in these environments and it's kind of like, I, I really think that, you know, having art in the walls, having a place that's soothing makes a big difference. And obviously like people constitute our environments. You can be in a scary place and someone like yourself can be absolutely wonderful and transform the place. But I think there's something in the, the places in which we practice and trying to make them beautiful, which I know as individual practitioners you can be like, I'm going to put a painting up, you know. <laughs> But maybe that's more of like an administrative, yeah. Yeah, you can try. You can try. Yeah, exactly. I was just going to ask if you knew of any countries or like any place that had successfully utilized this thought, um, where they, you know, treat mental illness with putting people in beautiful environments and natural environments to sort of uplift them. Yeah, that's I'm a thinking, great question. Like Finland or yeah, I mean, I'm, there's all kinds of things. You know, you like hear about forest bathing, and someone's like, we came up with this great new study that if you go outside once in a while, you feel a little less depressed. It's like, <laughs> oh, you mean I'm going to be less anxious if I'm, like, frolicking in a meadow? <laughs> really? Um, but it's, there are, like, different kind of, you know, instantiations, I'm sure, across time and history. I'm not an expert on that. Uh, my examples will probably all, my, my dissertation's work is on the 18th century. Um, but I can say that when we first started, um, like reforming kind of the asylum model in the late uh, 18th century, early 19th century, there was a really big emphasis on we're going to make these beautiful walkways and we're going to make a garden space. And the, the idea that kind of, you know, a place that is beautiful and kind of ordered will kind of impose order and calm on its inhabitants is an old one. Um, I would say that, oddly enough, our historical moment, we have probably lost that more than the last 2,000 years of medicine has. So. But yeah, good question. Great question. Thanks. One of the things that you said that struck me <clears throat> is the, that medicine cannot be secular. Now, one way to think of that, you, you, you made it as in belief is always involved, if I remember correctly. Um, but there's another way, right? Because the word secular means, of course, of this age. But all your patients, including the doctor and the staff, they're all going to die. And so there's a, there's a way in which you could say medicine is not, it cannot be secular because it unfailingly and inevitably deals with death. And either death has meaning or it's simply the extinguishment of life. And so uh, it, you, it struck me, so I, I'm, I'm thinking you have more to say about that. No, I mean, that's a wonderful observation. Um, I mean, in medicine, you know, we, we have hospice. We have, you know, we kind of, we've, we've shuttled that kind of expertise in dealing with death often onto, you know, other people. Um, and my experiences as a medical student, you, you don't get a lot of that until you get on the clinic. There's kind of a denial of, you know, you maybe get like one day that's like the, you know, breaking bad news to patients day and, you know, in terms of bereavement, and you're kind of like, okay, but, you know, the two things that everyone you're going to go through is birth and death. And if you don't have a medicine that recognizes that, you end up in some kind of questionable places. Um, but yeah, saying that, you know, we're, we're always have expectations. We always have beliefs. We always have some kind of expectation of what works and why it works. Um, you know, the bureaucracy of that, you know, you go to the, you know, general practice physician and you get a referral to a dermatologist. There's something almost like sanctifying about the process that then allows you access into that little room. Um, you know, after four months later that you're like, can you look at this mole for me? Um, and there's something in that that it's not. Nothing is ever completely modern. You know, Bruno Latour, we have never been modern. Um, we just keep replacing systems of, you know, 
um, objects and ritual with other ones. And it's up to us to, to, to determine which attachments and which objects and which kind of amulets and talismans that we choose to arm ourselves with. I love this talk. I actually worked in a hospital for 15 years and it was part of a group called Arts um, and Healthcare. There was this whole, you may have heard of Society of Arts and Healthcare. They disbanded, but great research um, resource for you. But I think what I liked what you were saying, when you were talking about being a student here and your poetry book in the lab, in your ideal world, when you think back, like if you could have created a class or could have created an environment that really meshed some of these things together to help um, teach this before you're in the clinic, like the nurse practitioner said, like how do I do this? Like I think that part of that is starting in education and starting to weave that in as part of the education process. Um, so I would just like, I'm sure you have ideas, like resources unlimited, what would you, what would you love to see? <laughs> well, yeah, resources unloaded. We could probably do a lot, but I mean, I can just <laughs> second. That's a yeah, excellent observation. Um, I mean, everyone has been making excellent observations um, that you know, medical schools now are required to have some kind of. I'm sure nursing programs as well. Um, there's some kind of like medical humanities person, and that it kind of ends up being the catch-all for you know wellness. Like ha ha ha. Like you know, you're burned out. Wellness, you know. Um, or you know you have art in the clinic or you have those things um, a lot of those things are really wonderful and there's been a lot of work um, I would say if, if I had unlimited funds I would say to rebuild it from the ground up and have you know medical health care training that is integrated with these things from the start that when you talk about you know a disease you get you know the history of it you get you know uh, um, literature about it you get art about it um, but unfortunately, at least the way that things are structured now, there are such heavy constraints of time um, that, you know, pending like a brand new institution that you, you know, build from the ground up that a lot of these things are, and they're, they're present and they're there, um, but a lot of them we kind of carry with us, you know, as well. We have time for one or two more questions if anybody, yeah, got one over here. Uh, so I was just wondering about um, the role of World War I um, in these figures and in their attitude towards mental health. That is a very big question. Books have been written on that question. Um, I might just have you direct to the, <laughs> the people who know much more than I. Um, John Garth is a great one in terms of thinking about Tolkien. Um, also, Holly Ordway just wrote a spiritual biography of Tolkien that I'm sure touched on that. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Lewis was traumatized. Lewis was traumatized by the experiences in war. He was traumatized. I mean, can you imagine for three weeks, someone that you loved and respected just in like violent delirium and there's no one else at home and it's just you? I mean, that's, that's traumatizing. I, I, I wouldn't want to speak about, you know, psychiatric care after that if you're 20 years old or so and that happens. Um, but yeah, I think the, the psychological aspect of what, you know, people experienced and culturally that degree of trauma, you hear it when they're like, the modern world, the modern world, it has, you know, it's gotta be colored by war. That's a great, great observation. One last question, or if not, we can continue the conversation over the Great Hall where there are refreshments. Please join us, and please join me in thanking, thanking Ms. O'Dell and Mark.